Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is part two of chapter three. Zombies, Vampires, and Specters of Capital, the New Occult Economies of Globalizing Capitalism. The dynamics of capitalist accumulation pose a fundamental challenge to bewitched economies based upon the zero-sum image. The apparently infinite capacity of capitalism to expand is simply not explicable in terms of this imaginary. As capitalist globalization has imposed market logics ever more directly on millions of African people, older witchcrafts have bumped up against their explanatory limits. The Ihan Zhu, for example, understand that no amount of local theft could possibly account for the vast array of goods they see today in stores and in the hands of the wealthy. As a result, they now speak of something that exceeds traditional witchcraft, a new mode of occult accumulation driven by business witches who do not need to devour and destroy in order to acquire. Magically transcending the limits of the zero-sum game, this new sorcery is capable of potentially infinite wealth creation, imagined in terms of great mountains of commodities and money. For the Temni of Sierra Leone, the new economic witchcraft pivots on invisible transactions that move money from people's pockets to those of witches, or stored in an invisible witch city, a place of skyscrapers, luxury cars, airports, VCRs, and street vendors who sell human meat on a stick. Similarly, novel economies of witchcraft have emerged in Cameroon. Many older modes of sorcery among the Maka of East Cameroon exhibited the anti-accumulative, leveling qualities detailed above. For the Maka, de Jambi has long been wielded by the weak against richer kin. Hostility to modernist plans for local economic development also informs a witchcraft called Gbadi, which originated in the late 1960s. Even more recently, however, new bewitched economies have emerged in Cameroon, known as Ikong Indula, a Niangu around Mount Cameroon, Famla or Kupi in the west and northwest, Kong in the forests of central and east Cameroon, all of which all of which revolve around witchcraft of labor. These new modes of sorcery speak, among other things, to the practices of famen, successful young entrepreneurs whose wealth is both magical and global in operation. Among the Bakwari, the practitioners of the new forms of so sorcery, Nyongo witches kill their victims, as do the older style witches, but rather than eating them, they convert them into zombie laborers. Similar ideas are found among many different peoples in Cameroon. Particularly interesting is Ikong among the Duwala or Dula a new urban magic in which people are sold rather than eaten. The profits from these zombie laborers are said to be credited directly to the witches' bank accounts. Despite their many differences of imagery and nuance, all these notions of witchcraft share the assumption that witches no longer see their fellow men as meat to be eaten, but rather as laborers to be exploited. In a similar vein, the Haya of the Kagra region of northwest Tanzania draw a distinction between sorcery and blood stealing. Sorcerers who have a leveling propensity seek to consume their victims. Blood stealers, on the other hand, decompose the body into its constituent parts, converting it into transactable units for sale. We witness here a shift from use value to exchange value. Rather than employing sorcery for immediate consumption, modern economic witches instead harness the productive capacities of victims for purposes of accumulation. In all these cases, bodies are not absorbed into the other, but transformed into extensions of the other. 
into forces of production, zombie laborers, or commodities for exchange. The expansive dynamic of capitalism intrudes here into the very grammar of witchcraft. No longer does demonic greed revolve around the simple appropriation and consumption of finite social wealth. At the same time that African economies are being ruthlessly subordinated to the neoliberal logic of capital through the combination of structural adjustment programs and world market pressures, witchcraft in urban sub-Saharan Africa has now entered the limitless circuits inscribed by the globalizing logic of capitalism. One sees aspects of this at work in rural settings as well, particularly in the growing number of regions in which land is being enclosed, privatized, and commodified. As these phenomena occur, massively accelerated by capitalist demand for primary products, cotton, coffee, oil, rubber, cocoa, copper, and the like, amid rising costs for food and fuel and a curtailing of credit for the rural poor, ownership of and access to land becomes increasingly precarious for the poor, while wealthier groups accumulate at their expense. In such circumstances, conflicts, often violent ones, over land, cattle, crops, and so on, frequently provoke allegations of witchcraft. Central to such developments is the erosion of kinship by market relations, as networks of reciprocity contract and kin are converted into strangers. With personal obligations being displaced by market relations, witchcraft itself takes on impersonal characteristics. Just as capital does not care about the identities of those who make a commodity, but merely about its profitability, so the new witchcraft transcends relations among neighbors and kin, and subtends a novel anonymity. Tracking these changes, people in southwestern Congo differentiate between the elders' sorcery and a new wild sorcery, whereas the former involves violations of the solidarity and reciprocity appropriate to kin relations. The latter entails misfortunes in which a person may become the victim of a total stranger's evil intentions or greed, evidence of the impersonal pressures of market-based appropriation and accumulation. This impersonal quality is also characteristic of the ritual murder that triggered the Atakoto riots in Oweri, Nigeria, in September 1996. As one analyst notes, the lack of relatedness between the young millionaires and their alleged victims is one of the most striking aspects of the stories of child kidnapping and ritual murder that circulated in the wake of the Oweri riots. However horrifying, evil deeds among kin are nonetheless explicable in terms of long-standing conceptions of the dangers that threaten communal life. One can at least plan for self-protection if names and faces are attached to those, neighbors or kin, who might threaten you. But if kidnapping, murder, and dismemberment become an impersonal business, then the dimensions of horror start to burst the boundaries of the known. In the, imperson in the impersonal tumult of the urban marketplace and the modern city, where evil is business, nothing personal, horror enters the terrifying machinery of random violence. No commentator has more insightfully examined such transformations in the African popular occult and their inter interrelation with cultural and economic change than historian Louise White. In a rich and nuanced analysis, White argues that vampires emerged in the African imaginary only in the 20th century, when the increasing penetration of capitalist imperatives provoked new ways of comprehending and portraying the dangers of everyday life. Indeed, she argues compellingly that vampire stories involved complex efforts to penetrate the mysteries of capitalist labor processes. White points out that many of the African terms that denote vampires derive from words used for specific groups who performed highly regimented work routines. The Swahili word wazimamodo derives from the term for firemen, for example, 
while the word for vampires in colonial northern Rhodesia, Benyama, Munyama in the singular, originally applied to game rangers. Most of these terms took on connotations of bloodsucking only in the 25 years after the First World War. They are, in short, early 20th century expressions, strictly demarcated from older vocabularies of witchcraft. For this reason, White treats vampire tales as entirely distinct from witchcraft stories. I have chosen a different tack, preferring to locate vampires within the vocabulary of witchcraft, while distinguishing among various genres of sorcery. Notwithstanding this difference, the distinctions that White draws are highly illuminating for my purposes. African vampires were a synthetic image, a new idiom for new times. Witches and vampires were different because they operated in different historical contexts. Vampires were a discursive contradiction, firmly embedded in local beliefs and constructions, but named in such a way that their outsidedness was foregrounded. Unlike witches, vampires were not rooted in local society. They did not fly or travel on familiars, but had mechanized mobility. Blood-sucking firemen had none of the personal malice of witches. It was a job. As such, it did not imperil people in tense relationships. It, it imperiled everyone. Firemen and their agents were not evil, but in need of money. Vampires were outside the social context that witches inhabited in East and Central Africa. They were seen to be internationalized, professionalized, supervised, and commodifying. This description traces semantic shifts that preceded, but conditioned, those I am describing. In insisting on the novelty of vampires in 20th century Africa, White highlights the ways in which new and increasingly capitalist social relations called forth new configurations of the popular imaginary. 20th century folk tales about vampires and bloodsucking provided, in turn, many of the discursive resources for the more recent spate of rumors and stories, which pivot on the image of the zombie laborer, with which I am concerned. Over the last 30 years or so, I submit vampires or the witches who appropriate human bodies and energies for purposes of incessant accumulation have become less foreign, particularly in urban settings in sub-Saharan Africa. While they may be enmeshed in mysterious global networks, they are typically Africans located in the impersonal tumult of economic life in large cities, such as Lagos, as well as considerably smaller cities and towns like Oweri. To be sure, the new sorcery is anonymous and businesslike. It is a professional rather than a personal affair. But those who engage in it are increasingly inside outsiders, Africans who have dangerous connections with the occult forces of global markets and enterprises. <coughs> Moreover, the victims await a new and highly specific fate, transformation into zombie laborers. Let us return, however, to White's appraisal of the emergence of African vampires in the first half of the 20th century. In a detailed and compelling analysis, she suggests that many African vampire stories grappled with the bizarre characteristics of capitalist labor processes and time discipline, struggling to find hidden meaning within activities that appeared meaningless. She points out, for instance, that firefighters in Nairobi during the 1930s were expected to drill and polish their equipment nine and a half hours a day, while the night watchmen had to make reports every 15 minutes. For this work, they were well paid by comparison with casual laborers. That such ostensibly pointless activities could garner regular wages was in itself a mystery requiring explanation. More than simply mysterious, however, there was something traumatic involved in subordination to a regime of wage labor. As E.P. Thompson pointed out in the case of the working class in 18th century England, capitalist time discipline is often experienced as a brutal assault on the social rhythms of pre-capitalist life. 
which are governed less by the abstract time of clocks and calendars divided into quantitative segments, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, than by qualitative fl fluctuation, fluctuations having to do with seasons, weather, light, and darkness, and the routines of labor, festivity, and celebration. The insistence that workers are to report to work at a set time and are to work an unvarying number of hours, day after day, month after month, irrespective of the season, the weather, darkness, or festival dates. All this involves a rupture in the qualitative patterns of concrete lived time in societies undergoing conquest by capital. Consequently, workers newly subjected to regimes of abstract quantity, quantitative time to bells, whistles, stopwatches, and punch clocks, typically find the experience deeply disturbing, as did African slaves in the plantation economy of the United States. In the African context, these upheavals in the character of lived time have often been experienced as painful ruptures in the very foundations of experience. Rather than merely a set of technical changes in the way in which goods are produced and distributed, capitalist wage labor entails radical disruptions in the fabric of everyday life, of space, time, body, and self. The spatialization of time, its transformation into quantitative units that lose their unique qualities, figures as a dramatic rupture in the texture of the social world. This is especially so once labor becomes regimented by the pace of machine production. Under these circumstances, not only are human beings treated like laboring machines, they are in fact compared to, measured against, and subordinated to the superior productive capacities of machines. Inserted into increasingly mechanized production processes, human productive activity is treated as a measurable thing-like entity. Labor in the abstract, stripped of all its unique features and characteristics. As human activity loses its, its significance within the automated operations of, mach of machine-driven production, it also loses its foundational properties. Rather than the animating power of the production process, labor is now eclipsed m by machines. This disappearance of concrete labor within a mechanized production process typically imperils conventional understandings of identity. The penetration of the self by machines comprises a monstrous threat to personhood, as if demonic forces are sucking the life from individuals. We should not be surprised to learn then that in the minds of colonial Katanga, Accusations of bloodsucking became especially persistent when mine owners tested mechanized shovels as an alternative to pick and shovel men. More recently, the quantification of time has assumed a prominent place in the witchcraft narratives that have emerged alongside the integration of the Maori of Niger into migrant labor markets. As I have noted, the forms of work and temporality characteristic of capitalism often appear deeply mysterious and threatening to those raised within alternative orders of experience. In a number of African vampire tales, as we have seen, it is taken for granted that something hidden and illicit is at work when firemen, for example, endlessly conduct drills and polish their machines and equipment. The apparently senseless repetition of physical movements and the deeply intrusive forms of work supervision are assigned enigmatic meanings drawn from the grammars of witchcraft. During the period between the world wars, police recruits in Kampala, for example, often believed that their highly regimented hierarchical and supervised work processes disguised the regime of bloodsucking. Vampire pits so hidden that they escaped the observation of most recruits were said to exist beneath station floors, a theme repeated in similar contexts in other parts of Africa. The structure of these tales delineates a cardinal feature of capitalism, the elusive purpose of the complex apparatus of capitalist production, supervision, and the perpetual motion of disciplined labor that drives it. 
the animating goal, the exploitation of labor and the production of surplus value for capital, remains obscure. As much as workers can feel its effects, they cannot see or touch the exploitation that marks their lives. Moreover, the same, dis the same disciplinary regimes are imposed on those, police, firefighters, nurses, and so on, who are not engaged in commodity production. And the rationale is, if anything, even more perplexing. By contrast, peasants forced to pay rents to a landowner have a hard and fast grasp of what is at stake. They know precisely the amount of product, money, or hours of labor they turn over to their immediate rulers. However much it may be resented, their exploitation is anything but mysterious. In capitalist society, on the other hand, an inherent mystery pervades work processes. Workers appear to be paid the value of their labor, wages, according to principles of free and fair exchange. Yet an invisible process of exploitation transpires all the same, one that fuels the accumulation of capital. These obscure techniques of accumulation become even more puzzling in the era of capitalist globalization, with the rise of remarkably complex, enigmatic forms of financial accumulation discussed in Chapter 2. Whatever else they may do, the vampire tales analyzed by Louise White endeavor to probe the mysteries of wage relations and capitalist labor processes, convinced that something more is going on than what meets the eye. These stories seek to map an archaeology of the invisible in capitalist modernity. This is doubly so for the more recent witchcraft narratives, which interrogate the occult powers that turn people into laboring zombies and human ATMs. In their hunt for the bodies that are being harmed and the blood that is being sucked, these stories seek out traces of the corporal powers upon which capital feeds, searching out the hidden processes by which embodied powers are appropriated and exploited, tracing the outlines of an occult economy that subsists on the energies of laboring bodies. The new genre of African witchcraft refuses the bourgeois narratives in which capitalist wealth gives birth to itself through a self-reproducing machinery that knows neither victims nor losers. In their insistence that something not quite real is at work within global capitalism, some occult process of exploitation that conceals itself, these tales carry a de-fetishizing charge. Across these stories, real bodies are implicated and at risk. They perform unseen zombie labor. They are possessed by evil, spirits that turn them into money machines. They are dissected from marketable parts. A hermeneutics of suspicion animates these folk tales, a thoroughgoing mistrust of the claim popular among postmodern theorists of the so-called informational economy, that we have transcended the eco economics of materiality. For all their involvement with witches and spirits, these stories are driven by a materialist impulse to search out the sites where laboring bodies are at risk. And in seeking out those bodies, these African discourses of witchcraft detail the ways in which they are enmeshed in dangerous logics of exploitation and accumulation. Nowhere more life-threatening than in sub-Saharan Africa itself. African fetishes and the fetishism of commodities. Having dared to raise the issue of fetishism, we are obliged to interrupt our story. For to invoke the fetish is to enter a territory shaped by the colonialist imaginary. The Western discourse of fetishism emerged, after all, in the early modern period when European traders and colonizers sought to, sought to regulate their shock over the ostensibly perverse non-market values to which Africans subscribed. Deeply unsettled by the refusal of Africans to part with certain goods irrespective of what was offered in return, even substantial amounts of gold, European merchants invented the African fetish, a term derived from the Portuguese feticho, which was a, or fetizo, something like that, which was adapted in turn from the Latin fe, fecir, to make or produce, and fictitious, manufactured artificial. As this, as this derivation indicates, 
Fetishes were regarded as entirely artificial entities. Rather than conforming to the natural market laws of the economic cosmos, they represented strange and unsettling human evaluations of things. These valuations were disturbing insofar as they substituted human conventions for the proper relations among things, exchange values, ostensibly ordained by God. They hinted at a world of chaos and caprice, beyond the rule governedness of science, religion, and the market. By treating the sacred items Africans would not trade as fetish objects, as expressions of bizarre and primitive human customs, European merchants simultaneously construed their own marketized value relations as part of the natural order of things, while positing African customs and practices as outrageous violations of all that is decent and proper. This was the interpretation advanced by the Dutch writer Willem Bosman, Bosman whose book, A New and Accurate Account of the, the Guinea Coast, published in 1703, issued in English and French translations by 1705 and released in German in 1706, decisively shaped the enlightened European discourse of fetishism. Both Newton and Locke owned Bosman's book, and the text was cited by Adam Smith in his lectures on jurisprudence. The concept of fetishism received its most protracted 18th century treatment in Charles de Brasse's Du culte des dieux fétiches, 1760, a text that drew the attention of the young Marx. In opposition to those who saw fetishes as allegorical, as had many early modern analysts of ancient Egypt, de Brasis was a literalist who read the attribution of extraordinary powers to animals and things as pure and simple idolatry. Moreover, he universalized fetishism rather than a uniquely African phenomenon. He saw it as natural to all childish, primitive, uncultivated, pre-rational minds as an aberration born of fear and madness. Of course he did. Let us now submit this analysis to a dialectical reversal. By interrogating the fetish as a product of the fears of the Europeans who constructed it, rather than of those upon whom it was projected, we can discern the anxious premonition the concept was meant to contain, and insisting that certain goods not be commodified. After all, Af Africans were exposing as fictive all claims for the universality and naturalness of the European market economy. In a revealing passage in a book published four years before, Du Cult des Dieux Fetiches, de Bras De Bras claims of primitive peoples, for example, almost everywhere they have been found in a state of ferocious stupidity, perfidiousness, and unapproachable. In some places, they have even appeared to lack a taste for commerce and for the novelties which have been shown to them. They have maintained an obstinate silence. This obstinate silence represents the refusal to name a price the unwillingness to agree that every object must have a market value. For Europeans imbued with the commercial mentality, with the idea that the market economy corresponds to the natural order of things, this silence before the gods of the market was nothing less than heresy, a perverse refusal of one's natural duty. The idea that some things transcended the laws of value and exchange and could not be priced amounted to the claim that these laws were not natural, invariable, and transhistorical. If, in fact, every human had a natural propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another, as Adam Smith urged, then how could it be that Africans and others lacked a taste for commerce? The only reassuring answers were that Africans had undergone some perversion from the natural course of things, or that their nature was not entirely human. In the face of the anxieties aroused by the non-market values of African peoples, Europeans constructed a marker of African primitiveness and perversion, the fetish. This construct tamed the anxieties brought on by observation of peoples who shunned the logic of the market. As in Freud's account of sexual fetishism, the fetishist is reassured by the creation of an object that covers over a frightening absence. 
but instead of the absent female phallus, European traders and writers invented the fetish in order to mask the absence of market values among Africans. In their case, too, a frightening discovery, the market logic is by no means universal, was denied. After all, the only real alternative to constructing the discourse of the fetish and its mapping of the natural versus the perverse would have been to acknowledge the historic historicity of European market relations, to recognize that the system was anything but natural and universal. And this would have been to contribute to a defetishizing critique of capitalism itself. In an interesting passage in Capital, Marx suggests the whole mystery of commodities, all the magic and necromancy that surrounds the products of labor on the basis of commodity production vanishes as soon as we come to other forms of production. He forgot to add, however, that this mystery will not vanish if, in the face of other forms of production, people imbued with market rationality manufacture the idea of the fetish. As a defensive reaction formation, a structure of denial about the historicity of capitalism, the fetish preserved the ostensible universality of capitalism. Or, to put it somewhat differently, the European creation of the African fetish closed off defetishizing knowledge of capitalism itself. If this was the function of the fetish for Europeans unsettling or unsettled by the non-market values of African peoples, what can we say of its content of the actual properties Europeans attributed to fetishes? As William Peets observes, the African fetish, as constructed by the European Enlightenment, is irreducibly material and singular. Rather than seeing every entity as partaking of a universal category, or in the case of the capitalist economy, seeing every good in terms of a general property value that makes, its, that makes it exchangeable with any and every other, Africans ostensibly held to the idea that some things were radically unique, not commensurable with others. Uncritically accepting this view of the African mind, Hegel proceeded to deny reason and history to Africa. The attribution of divine power to singular objects demonstrates, he argued, that Africans lack the category of universality, the basis of human rational thought. Rather than a world organized in terms of universal relations, which are the stuff of scientific knowledge, Africans inhabit, according to Hegel, a fantastic world of fetish objects that simply reflect the arbitrary choice of those who made them. One discerns in Hegel's analysis, which rehearses a racist anthropology of the civilized and the barbaric, the presence of repressed colonial desires. After all, the insistence that Africans are attached to the irreducible singularity of material things is easily read as containing a secret urge to escape the abstracting circuits of the commodity form. In returning to the material uniqueness of things and attending to what makes entities different to, sen to sensate bodies, African fetish objects, as imagined by Europeans, carried a powerful erotic charge. It is interesting in this regard that, for Africans, many of these fetishes are objects of the body, devoted to its health, biological reproduction, and the well-being of embodied social organization, the body politic. Fetishes are thus directed to the types of corporal needs and desires that are systematically suppressed in the abstracting logic of commodification. The young Marx may have intimated something of this when he seized on one European characterization of fetishism as the religion of sensuous desire. Initially, however, Marx simply used a strategy of reversal, turning the change or turning the charge of fetishism back against the ruling classes of Europe, insisting that it was they who bowed down before objects, gold in the case of the Spanish colonizers of the Americas, and wood where the rulers of the Rhineland were concerned. Rather than the rationalists they believe themselves to be, claimed the young Marx, the European ruling classes in fact idolize things. They engage in fetish worship. Clearly there is much to this argument. 
Consider, for example, the map published with the first English edition of Bosman's new and accurate account of the Guinea coast divided into the gold, the slave, and the ivory coasts, where, as the title suggests, coastal spaces are identified with commodities. One encounters here a geography of commodities, with the West African coast mapped in terms of commercial goods sought by Europeans. In a mania of reductionism, the Guinea coast is divided into four commodified segments, thus inscribing, thus inscribing the totalizing logic of the commodity form into the land itself, and reducing the rich diversity of Africa, including its people, to a list of commodities. Marx's ironic attack on the European ruling classes as idolaters, as people who worship things, finds its vindication in a map such as this. But as he developed his systematic critique of political economy, Marx observed an even greater irony that commodity fetishism is also a, a religion of non-sensuous desire. However, much capitalist fetishism bows down before things. Its true god is entirely immaterial. After all, it does not want these things for their material properties. Rather, it seeks that common, invisible, and immaterial property that all contain value. This is the great insight of Peter Stellabris, who grasped the powerful irony that drives Marx's defetishizing critique. To fetishize commodities is, in one of Marx's least understood jokes, he writes, to reverse the whole history of fetishism, for it is to fetishize the invisible, the immaterial, the supersensible. The value of commodities on capitalist markets has nothing to do, after all, with their sensible material features. If it did, then radically dissimilar goods, from grain to gold, iron to digital information, coffee beans to the act of copulation, could not exchange with each other and could not be measured on the same scale via money. Yet, despite their radical dissimilarities, any and all goods in a capitalist economy, and this includes services, can enter into exchange with the whole world of commodities. Every conceivable good can have a price, a marker of its universal exchangeability. This can only mean, however, that the commensurability of goods, their capacity to operate as repositories of value in a world of commodity exchange, does not reside in any of their material properties. If it did, then they could not exchange with those that lacked these properties. Value must, as we have seen, be something immaterial, something all commodities share irrespective of their sensible differences. It is only their property as products of human labor in the abstract, labor stripped of all material specificity, which makes commodities commensurable. But this means that value, the driving force that generates the manic activity of capital, is entirely invisible, intangible, an objectively effective power that operates by means of a phantom-like objectivity. When we fetishize commodities, therefore, we attribute extraordinary powers to an immaterial substance. However much we may confuse the value of things with their material, th with their material being, which results in the crude materialism associated with commodity fetishism. We are, in practice, bowing down before something phantom-like, something supra-sensible. This allows us to appreciate the cleverness of what Stellabras describes as one of Marx's least understood jokes. For if Africans are alleged to have worshipped the irreducible materiality of things to have participated in a religion of sensuous desire, the commodity fetishist, fetishist practices an even more bizarre religion of non-sensuousness, a fantastic desire for the merely spectral, spectral form of things. Many commentators miss the significance of this critical move, in part because they trace the theory of commodity fetishism to the Protestant critique of idolatry. This interpretation sees Marx's concept as heir to a religious critique of practices that substitute human artifacts and customs for nature.
The central error of this heresy is said to be that it did that it dignifies human labor in a place of God's work, or in place of God's work, contributing thereby to a fetishization of the merely human. Yet, to read the theory of commodity fetishism in these terms is, as we noted in chapter 2, to miss a central thrust of Marx's historical materialism, in which it is the elevation of the gods of value and capital above human agents that is the problem. Marx thus significantly reverses the Lutheran criticism, which is fundamental to all idealism, spiritualism, by locating fetishism in devaluations and dislocations of human activity, and the denigration of the merely human that results when people become subordinated to things and powers of their own making. Thus, while there is a crude materialism associated with commodity fetishism, its misattribution of value to the material properties of things, there is equally, and in some respects, more crucially, a wild spirit spiritualism, the worship of the phantom-like objectivity of value, the elevation of abstractions above people and objects. Since value, and its most appropriate formal expression, money, seeks to transcend sensuousness, its fetishization results in the idealist capitalist contempt for the concrete, the sensuous, and the embodied. As in religion, so in capitalist society, the material world is subordinated to non-material powers. In treating things and the products of human labor as artificial and impure, Protestantism fetishizes the immaterial, God. For this reason, it is the most appropriate religion to capitalism. Yet, value can only exist by inhabiting or possessing things and bodies, since only actual concrete goods can exchange with one another. This produces that vulgar materialism, the worship of objects, which is one side of commodity fetishism, the side that is seized on exclusively in many accounts. After all, as much as capital can as much as capital as much as capital insists that it is everything and that and that the material world of nature and humans counts for nothing it inevitably fixates on the very natural objects it has scorned to truly abandon the world of nature and human material practice would signal its death for all its ghostly objectivity value flourishes only by attaching itself to entities whose objectivity is ab is appreciably more palpable. Value needs, as Marx puts it, things and persons which will act as its bearers. And this returns us to the fetishes that haunt sub-Saharan Africa today. After all, Africa continues to be plundered for the products of nature. Ivory, rubber, diamonds, cocoa, cotton, gold, oil, digging, cutting, and pumping, slashing through forests and jungle, blasting great holes into the earth, Capitalism in Africa seems intent on nothing less than a veritable war against nature. And with each manic effort to seize their continent's natural wealth, Africans have been captured, whipped, beaten, worked to death, structurally adjusted, also that nature might be despoiled, people might be downtrodden, and capital might accumulate. The fury directed against nature and laborers has swelled into a monstrous system of violence and mayhem. Private militias, state and colonial armies have marauded across the continent, ensuring that the natural resources ripped from the earth stay in the hands of the richest and most powerful. Goethe's Faust, the momentous tragedy whose theme is the manic energies unleashed by emergent capitalism, would have found an appropriate setting in Africa. Daily they would vainly storm, pick and shovel, stroke for stroke. Where the flames would nightly swarm was a dam when we awoke. Human sacrifices, bled, tortured screams would pierce the night. And where blazes seaward spread, a canal would greet the light. When the African explorer-adventurer Henry Morton Stanley oversaw construction on behalf of King Leopold of Belgium of a, of a 400 kilometer long road from the mouth of the Congo to what is now Kinshasa, Kinshasa, his crews blasted their way through mountains and hills. 
This frenetic creative destruction earned him the moniker Bula Matari, breaker of rocks, a term that, in later years, the people of the Congo would use to describe the machinery of the state. There is a marvelous poetic wisdom contained in this description. Intuitively, the Congolese people discerned that colonial and post-colonial states embody the same wild energies that brought their continent into the orbit of European colonialism and unleashed a torrent of murder, a breaking of rocks and skulls, whose end is not in sight. In Faust, that profound fable of capitalist modernity, Goeth figured these same wild energies as diabolical powers, pretending immense suffering and destruction. And in the tales of vampires and witches stalking sub-Saharan Africa today, these energies are imagined as monstrous forces that capture bodies dissect them and sell their parts, or turn them into money-generating zombie laborers. These African tales carry a defetishizing charge in their insistence that something strange and mysterious, something that threatens the bodily and moral foundations of social life, is at work in the global circuits of capital accumulation. This premonition has nothing to do with trade and market exchange being foreign to African history. Many pre-colonial African societies were extensively familiar with markets and trade, but they were not societies which subordinated all aspects of socio-economic life to regulation by the market, which is why non-commodifiable goods, fetishes to Europeans, were a permanent feature of social life. It is a token of just how reified everyday life has become in the West that most of us no longer find global capitalist processes bizarre and perplexing. So natural have commodified market relations become for us, so normalized the esoteric transactions of capital that we rarely find anything unsettling about it at all. As a result, our mode of perception dulls, our critical energies atrophy. Unable to see the tracks of the invisible, we deny existence to whatever eludes our optical gaze. We lose touch with the hermeneutics of suspicion that animates much African folklore. These popular genres, however, remain attentive to the mysteries and sorceries of capital. The fetishes they describe, vampires and economic witches, are thus tokens of, defet of defetishization. To be sure, these tokens retain the limits inherent in all folk tales. They inadequately map global processes, too often mobilizing volatile anxieties and desires. If their critical insights are to be cultivated, these stories must be refracted through a dialectical optics. As we shall see, some extraordinary works of African literature manage to do just this. But before turning to these issues, we need to consider the figure which accompanies the, the vampire and African witchcraft tales in the age of globalization, the zombie. The living dead, zombie laborers in the age of globalization. Observing the proliferation of zombie stories coming out of South Africa today, one radical co commentator suggests, the images of zombies in these stories are not derived from traditional South African folklore but are rather taken full-blown from American horror films. There is a failure of dialectical imagination in such a claim, one that fails to grasp, grasp the flows and counterflows of meaning through which figures of horror are constituted in late capitalism. To begin with, Hollywood's zombies are themselves adapted directly from the experience of enslaved Africans and their descendants in the former colony of Haiti to the degree to which American horror film transmits zombie images to Africa, it reworks a cultural product of the African diasporic experience. So when zombies populate the African cultural imaginary today, they carry deep charges that run through the modern African historical experience. More than this, what distinguishes the African stories we have tracked is the specific imagery of the zombie laborer. And precisely this figure is glaringly absent in American horror film of the neoliberal era. Hollywood's zombies today are creatures of consumption, 
brazenly mobbing stores and malls and consuming human flesh, not living dead producers of wealth for others. Rather than engaging in a sort of reverse exoticism, in which it appropriates the mythologies of the imperial center, therefore African popular culture has produced a highly distinctive trope, one that builds on Haitian images of zombies, in order to track the unseen laborers of a global imperial economic order. Let us consider the history of the zombie image in this light. The earliest known origins of the zombie can be traced to West Africa, specifically the region of the Lower Congo, where religious idioms identified the Nzambi, the, sorry, the Nzambi, god or spirit, the, fuck, I can't pronounce this at all. The Nzambi was embedded in West African belief systems, which held that the dead can return to visit their families, bringing either assistance or harm. But in Haiti, where by 1789, half a million slaves toiled in French plantations in conditions approximating industrial labor, the idea of the dead moving among the living was transmuted, transmuted into the notion of the living dead people lacking all aspect of human personality, save the bodily capacity for mindless toil. In the Haitian context, the zombie became a figure of extreme reification, a living laborer capable of drudgery on behalf of others, but entirely lacking in memory, self-consciousness, identity, and agency, the very qualities we associate with personhood. It is particularly revealing that zombie legends acquired a unique resonance during the period of American occupation of Haiti, which is 1915 to 34, when U.S. Marines used forced labor to build roads and other infrastructure. It was during this period that one of the most influential English language depictions of the zombie appeared. William Seabrook's The Magic Island, 1929, written after the author spent a year with a Haitian family that allegedly initiated him into the practices of voodoo. While this book is chock full of ethnocentric stereotypes, Seabrook manages to offer a highly poetic account of zombies, one that, one that reverberated throughout Depression era America and formed the basis for the creature's earliest filmic representations. In a significant chapter entitled Dead Men Walking in the Cane Fields, Seabrook recounts a friend's response to a question about zombie superstition in Haiti with the following remarks. Alas, these things and other evil practices connected with the dead exist. They exist to such an extent that you whites do not dream of, though evidences are everywhere under your eyes. At this very moment in the moonlight, there are zombies working on this island. If you will ride with me tomorrow night, Yes, I will show you dead men working in the cane fields. The friend proceeds to describe a group of zombies as a band of ragged creatures who shuffle along, staring dumbly like people walked in a day, walking in a daze. They are vacant-eyed like cattle and make no reply when asked to give their names. Intriguingly, Seabrook's friend alleges that zombies work in the fields of the Haitian American Sugar Company, a firm whose main plant is described in terms reminiscent of Marx as an immense factory plant dominated by a huge chimney with clanging machinery, steam whistles, freight cars. Finally, when he takes the author to wit witness the creatures for himself, Seabrook writes that he observed three supposed zombies who continued dumbly at work. There was something about them unnatural and strange. They were plotting like brutes, automatons. Without stooping down, I could not fully see their faces, which were bent expressionless over their work. The eyes were the worst. They were in truth like the eyes of a dead man, not blind, not staring, unfocused, unseeing. The whole face, for that matter, was bad enough. It was vacant, as if there was nothing behind it. It seemed not only expressionless, but incapable of expression. Whatever we make of these claims, Seabrook's account became the point of reference for the earliest depictions of zombies in American literature and film. 
Moreover, the central features of his rendition mesh with those found in another influential portrayal by Alfred Metro in his book Le Vadou Haitien from 1957. The zombie remains in that gray area separating life and death. He moves, eats, hears, even speaks, but has no memory and is not aware of his condition. The zombie is a beast of burden exploited mercilessly by his master, who forces him to toil in his fields, crushes him with work, and whips him at the slightest of pretexts. The life of the zombie on the mythical level is similar to that of the old slaves of Santa, Santo Domingo. Zombies can be recognized by their vague look, their dull, almost glazed eyes. It is this view of zombies as mindless laborers that entered the American culture industry in the 1930s and 1940s, a point to which I return in the conclusion. But as I show there, the idea of the zombie as a living dead laborer was displaced in American cultural production in the late 1960s by that of the ghoulish consumer. While this is an intriguing cultural shift, it moved the image away from those features that are particularly resonant in the African context in the neoliberal era. To put it plainly, if Hollywood zombies today are largely mindless consumers, in Africa they are mindless workers. This is why, as one of the most sensitive commentators on Haitian zombies has put it, the zombie is a mythic symbol of alienation, of a spiritual as well as a physical alienation, of the dispossession of the self through the reduction of the self to a mere source of labor. Those passingly familiar with Marx's accounts of alienated labor and reification will recognize profound intersections between those texts and this image of the zombie, the very imagery that has been reactivated across so much of the African subcontinent today. I shall return to these intersections in the conclusion, where I will also explore the notion of zombie rebels. But for the moment, we ought to appreciate that, rather than mere rehearsals of Hollywood's mythologies, contemporary African zombie legends carry a much more powerfully critical charge, one that brings us back to the question of laboring bodies in the age of, of capitalist globalization. Vampire Capitalism in Sub-Saharan Africa let us now return to metaphors of vampire accumulation in sub-Saharan Africa today and the soil out of which they grow. This will assist us in grasping the complex association of violence with cryptic accumulation that forms the basis for popular African imaginings of late capitalism. To be sure, sub-Saharan Africa represents a complex, highly differentiated subcontinent. The distinctions between, say, Togo and Nigeria are manifold. Nevertheless, as we have seen, shared histories and structural positions make it possible to map the location of specific regions in the world system. The following account of crucial historical processes and social relations is inevitably a stylized one, but this has certain advantages for our purpose. The critical analysis of folkloric understandings of the occult economies of late capitalism as it highlights key registers in which late capitalism is experienced across the African subcontinent. The nine themes sketched out below thus comprise axes of experience that inform the regional imaginary. 1. A legacy of colonial violence. Africa's insertion into the European world economy was inseparable from colonial wars and the trade in human beings. Insisting on these processes as integral to the origin of world capitalism, Marx memorably pronounced that capital comes into the world dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt. To be sure, a few countries on the subcontinent were, not, were never colonized and a number of societies were never directly incorporated into the slave trade. But the connection of the region to global circuits of capital was nonetheless built on these foundations. And these global circuits did indeed run through blood and dirt, as millions were uprooted and sold to perish en route to plantations in the Americas, or to perform forced labor for white overseers. 
armed with whips and guns, and deploying rape, kidnapping, and multiple forms of physical, social, and psychic violence. On top of this, perhaps a quarter of the people of West Africa were enslaved at home, forced to work in the textile or palm oil industries, among others. The end of the slave trade by no means reduced the scale of violence. The insatiable appetite of the colonizers for the natural wealth of the continent, gold, diamonds, rubber, palm oil, copper, ivory, coffee, invariably spelled conflict, abetted by the collusion of local elites. As emergent colonial capitalism came fully into its own in Africa after about 1880, the scale of the violence grew ominously. I intend to treat them like dogs, announced Leander Starr Jameson, High Commissioner for Cecil Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes's Southern African Settlement. In this spirit, African compounds were burned, caves full of Shona fighters dynamited, lands stolen, thousands murdered. In King Leopold's Belgian colony of the Congo, millions were killed, perhaps as many as 10 million. In a campaign of forced labor, kidnapping of whole villages, forcible dislocation, and systematic executions. African communities often, res or often resisted the colonial violence with extraordinary determination. But the brutality of the colonizers was unrelenting. When Africans resisted forced labor in the rubber trade, their hands would be chopped off by Belgian troops who left the victims to die while mounting the severed hands on stakes as a warning to others. As European colonialism dispossessed people of their land, drove them into forced labor, imposed taxes, and conscripted African men into their armies, they drowned one revolt after another in blood. In the Maji Maji uprising in southern Tanganyika, um, in 1905-07, a rebellion against both forced labor on cotton plantations and the taxes extracted by German colonialism, the colonizers responded by killing at least 12,000 Africans. 45 years later, British troops wiped out similar numbers while repressing the Mau Mau revolt in Kenya. In Africa, global capitalism keeps rehearsing these origins and accumulation through violence and war, and this has been formative for the regional imaginary. Ben Okri captures something of this in his novel, Infinite Riches, where he portrays the dreams of a colonial governor general of an African nation on the eve of its independence. The governor general then dreamt of a luxurious road over the ocean, a road that was fed from all parts of Africa. A macadam road of fine crushed diamonds and sprinkled silver and laminated topaz. A road that gave off the sweet songs of mermaids and nereids. Beneath this marvelous road, there were dead children and barbarous fetishes, savage masks and broken spines, threaded veins and matted brains, decayed men and embalmed women. It was a road made from the teeth and skulls of slaves made from their flesh and woven intestines. Two, colonialism, dispossession, and the forcible imposition of monetized relations. During the period of full-fledged colonial rule, roughly 1880 to 1960, the European powers worked systematically at subjecting Africans to market economics. They largely remained cautious, however, about creating a black urban working class. As a result, while avoiding a full-fledged pr proletarianization of Africans, they imposed monetary taxes to press the colonized into commercialized farming, sometimes supplemented by wage labor. By forcing Africans into monetary relations, such taxes, which encountered widespread resistance, led to an intrusion of market imperatives and to the semi or full proletarianization of many who were unable to pay. And in some parts of the subcontinent, notably Southern Africa, Kenya, and the Rhodesias, taxes were sometimes deployed in order to drive large numbers of people off their lands, leaving them little option but to seek paid labor in order to survive. There are few clearer indicators of the purposes of these policies than the fact that, in many cases, 
there was one way for Africans to win relief from taxes, by proving that they had worked a sufficient number of days for Europeans during the previous year. Colonial taxation, frequently in the form of hut or poll taxes, was thus a sell was thus a deliberate instrument for heightened commercialization of economic life and the semi-proletarianization of many Africans. A case in point is the British South Africa Company, which imposed taxes of 10 shillings per year so that indigenous peoples would be forced into market relations, and in this case into labor markets, in order to raise the means of payment. The governor of the British Protectorate of Kenya in 1913 articulated this practice as a cornerstone of colonial policy. We consider that the only natural and automatic method of securing a constant labor supply is to ensure that there will be competition among laborers for hire and among employers for laborers. Such competition can be brought about only by a rise in the cost of living for the native and this can be produced only by an increase in the tax. Contrary to the governor, there was nothing natural about it. Colonialism aimed at the deliberate construction of market relations, and in some circumstances at forcing Africans into markets as sellers of their labor power. This meant using coercive means, taxes backed up by military force. The Magi Magi revolt, after all, was in part a rebellion against colonial taxes. From the start, nascent capitalism social rela or sorry, from the start, nascent capitalist social relations were thus experienced as unnatural, as a foreign imposition designed to destroy customary ways of life. Three. Colonial and postcolonial states as bodies of armed men. If capitalist states always involve a shifting balance between coercion and consent, between the use of force and strategies of legitimation, as Gramsci suggested, colonial capitalism tends to tip decisively in the former direction. Here, more than anywhere else, states resemble bodies of armed men, to deploy Engels' metaphor, and post-colonial states have largely persisted in this pattern for a number of compelling reasons. First, subordination to the capitalist world economy has meant that all post-colonial states in Africa, even those that sought an African socialism, found themselves sooner or later, and to differing degrees, recolonized by the world market. Sometimes eagerly, sometimes through incremental but grinding pressures of the world market and international financial institutions, local elites were fashioned into homegrown personifications of capital prepared to operate as the privileged local gendarmes of the world system. Inevitably, the imperatives of capitalist accumulation exacerbated social inequalities, deepening the stratifications and class divisions in African societies and inducing cycles of resistance which have been countered by brute force. Secondly, post-colonial states inherited spatial administrative structures often binding together hundreds of ethnic groups that lacked organic social unity. While a radical political project might have generated new solidarities, official processes of decolonization were frequently hastened in order to deprive radical movements of time to build a mass base with which to contest elections. Having tried to abort the emergence of militant mass movements or crush them where they did emerge, the Belgian Congo, for instance, colonialists would oversee the installation of conservative elements into state office. Once in control of the state machinery, these forces typically used patronage and spoils to construct an elite coalition, often drawn from specific ethnic groups which dominated state and economy. This set in motion a truncated dialectic in which opposition parties and movements in turn appealed to the excluded on grounds of ethnicity, not class. The result has been a pattern of ethnic conflict, in fact the product of elite class projects linked to imperial power, not something inherent in cultural differences, that has reinforced violence and state coercion. Related to this, thirdly, is the frailty of local processes of capital accumulation. 
since African capitalism is decidedly weak, with manufacturing and finance confined to local markets, marginalized in world markets and foreign dominated, rarely have these societies undergone processes of sustained and diversified accumulation of the sort that took place in Europe and North, Af and North America, parts of, parts of Latin America, and more recently in East Asia. As a consequence, indigenous ruling classes generally lack viable bourgeois national projects that could rally the support of considerable social strata, whose members see themselves as beneficiaries of a growing and developing national economy. African ruling classes thus lack national accumulation strategies that can provide the social material foundation for ruling class hegemonies that tip more to consent than coercion. The combined effect of these processes is the persistence of state forms that rest upon and reproduce social and political violence. And as economic crisis has accompanied leo neoliberal globalization, these tendencies have been intensified in a context of declining living standards and conditions of life. Four, neoliberalism, structural uh, adjustment and mass impoverishment. While the neoliberal programs of structural adjustment promoted by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, IMF, have, a, have as one of their ostensible aims the rooting out of corruption from African regimes, these programs of mass impoverishment have, in fact, merely reshaped the terrain for swindling and looting. Structural adjustment, usually required by Western governments, the World Bank, and the IMF, as a condition for urgently needed loans, involves a package of reforms with the following features. Massive cuts in public spending, leading to mass layoffs, the closing of schools and hospitals, the elimination of state subsidies on basic commodities consumed by the poor, such as grains, flour, and heating oil, privatization of state enterprises, mines, trading companies, public utilities, water systems, devaluation of the local currency, which pushes up the prices for imported goods consumed by the population and cheapens exports, thus impoverishing millions of agricultural producers while bringing in less to the national treasury and driving up the trade deficit, opening up the national economy to foreign ownership, liberalization of the financial system, which relaxes conditions for new banks and other lending institutions to form encourages Western banks to set up shop and frequently breeds shady financial practices. One African nation after another has heeded the prescriptions of the Western International Financial Institutions, IFIs. The results have been catastrophic. While Sub-Saharan Africa exports a much higher share of its gross domestic product than do countries in North America, Europe, or Latin America, exactly the route the IFIs proclaim as the road to prosperity, the vast majority are in an economic freefall. Across the 1980s, as structural adjustment was implemented, national output per capita persistently contracted in one, in one African nation after another. For the content as a whole, or for the continent as a whole, the average decline was about 2% per annum. The most serious drop, 4.6% annually, occurred in Côte d'Ivoire, the World Bank's poster boy for neoliberal economics. Indeed, despite its adherence to neoliberal dogma, Africa as a whole continues to attract less and less foreign direct investment. FDI. The continent's share of the FDI flowing to developing regions fell from 13.8% in the mid-1980s to 5.3% by the early 1990s. Put in global terms, Africa attracts less than 1% of world FDI. Meanwhile, manufacturing industries are collapsing and unemployment is soaring as, courtesy of trade liberalization, imports flood local markets. By the early 1990s, for example, the industrial sector in Lagos, Nigeria's largest city, 
end the site of much of the country's manufacturing industry was operating at a mere 36% of capacity as factories closed or cut back under the impact of global competition. Hammered by declining foreign investment, disintegrating manufacturing industries, and plummeting prices for primary products, cocoa, cotton, palm oil, minerals, coffee, and the like, African nations have had no option if they are to obey the rules of the game, but to go begging to international lenders in an effort to keep their economies afloat. The accompanying devaluation of local currencies directed by the IFIs then drives up the costs of borrowing, which affects all economic agents who must devote a larger share of incomes to debt repayment. By the early 1990s, Africa as a whole had accumulated foreign debts equal to 70% of total annual output. This combined debt represents four times the value of everything the continent exports in a year. The consequences are staggering. By 2000, Sub-Saharan Africa was sending $337 million per day to the West in debt repayment. Through these global circuits of debt and structural adjustment, as one African political economist argues, the continent is being subjected to a systematic recolonization. Little wonder folklore and mass culture imagine global corporations to be sucking the blood of the subcontinent. Perhaps the most staggering statistic in this regard comes from the World Bank itself. Between 1987 and 2000, per capita incomes in sub-Saharan Africa contracted by fully 25%. Yet even that statistic is too rosy. Currency devaluations required by the IFIs have sent the costs of basic goods like bread and heating oil soaring, while the speculation induced by financial liberalization has driven rents and housing costs astronomically higher. Meanwhile, collapsing prices for agricultural products force millions to abandon the land and head for already overcrowded cities lacking adequate housing, sanitation, and running water. Lagos alone, to which I return shortly, receives 300,000 new entrants each year. The human, toil, the human toll is shocking. Countries like the Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Congo, Congo Brazzaville, once classified as medium income countries, have experienced a horrifying regression. 70% of the people live below the poverty threshold, earning a dollar or less per day, and life expectancy, which was 58 in 1950, fell to 51 by 2000. Indeed, Zambia, Zim Zimbabwe, the Ivory Coast, and Kenya have life expectancies below 50 and moving toward 45, as falling standards for nutrition and, and rising disease rates ravage the population. All told, indices of human development are regressing in 14 countries on the African subcontinent. Taking the African continent as a whole, the production and availability of food, industrial output, education, per capita income, and life expectancy are all plummeting. 5. Accumulation by violence, militarized predator capitalism, and struggles to control resource extraction. In a context of staggering regression, the economies of sub-Saharan Africa have been thrown back in onto primary commodities derived from agriculture or mining as their only substantial asset on the, war on the world market. Across the subcontinent, involvement in the world economy pivots on the extraction of natural resources. In 1965, fully 93% of sub-Saharan Africa's merchandise exports consisted of natural resources or primary commodities. Despite rhetorics of development, this reliance on raw materials remains effectively unchanged. Worse, the terms of trade have consistently shifted to the disadvantage of primary producers, as prices of precious metals and agricultural goods have fallen relative to those of manufactured goods. Between 1980 and 2000, for instance, cotton prices dropped by 40, 47%, those for coffee by 64%, while cocoa and sugar lost three quarters of their market value. These catastrophes have locked most of, locked most of Africa into a devastating cycle of impoverishment. 
For many elites on the African subcontinent, though South Africa is a significant partial exception, the only viable strategy for accumulation is to use the national state or to seize control over a resource-rich territory within the nation state in order to reap the rents. The taxes that can be demanded of multinational firms mining for diamonds, copper, gold, cobalt, magnesium, and the like that accrue to those who can claim ownership or control of the natural resources of the nation, its land, its minerals, its agricultural products, its oil. The result is a rentier style capitalism in which local elites live off rents rather than the profits generated by capitalist industry. Multinational corporations looking to exploit these resources are only too happy to collaborate in the business of taxes, bribes and armed thuggery if it allows them to monopolize access to scarce resources. As a result, much competition for capital and power takes the form of bitter struggles to control the state or to fracture it by seizing sub-national territories rich in primary commodities. These methods of accumulation by violence, reminiscent of the strategies deployed by the colonialists, are at the heart of a number of the civil wars gripping sub-Saharan Africa today. However much these may express themselves in ethnic form, at issue is a contest to control natural resources in order to accumulate on the basis of the rents derived from them. Even a study by World Bank analysts found that it is not long-standing ethnic grievances but economic conflict which is the key to understanding African civil wars since 1965. The upshot is a militarized form of capitalism in which contending fractions of the ruling classes appear as predators using force to monopolize the natural wealth of whole nations or parts thereof. 6. Vampire capitalism run amok, the road to social disintegration. Because so much of sub-Saharan Africa lacks any viable basis for sustained projects of capitalist development, predatory methods of accumulation described above predominate. As these involve little more than securing the technological and military means to rip resources from the ground, little of, little of which will be reinvested in local industries, a form of parasitism red readily emerges in which fortunes accrue to those who control the state or subnational territories and military forces. State power and the exercise of violence tend in these circumstances to become grotesquely individualized, manifest in the personal dictatorships of the likes of Joseph, Joseph Mobutu Sese Seko, who ruled Zaire and siphoned off between four and six billion US dollars before being overthrown in 1997. General Mohammed Siad Bar, who dominated Somalia from 1969 to 1991, General Mariam Babangida, who managed to loot perhaps $12 billion from the Nigerian Treasury during his rule, 1985 to 93, or his successor, General Sani Abaki, who is believed to have pilfered $4 billion in a mere five years as head of state. These political phenomena inhere in the very forms of post-colonial capitalism in much of sub-Saharan Africa. In turn, predatory accumulation tends to undermine the very bases of the domestic economy, making strategies of national development even more precarious. Mobutu's Zaire is an extreme case in point. As one commentator has put it, to visit, to visit Zaire in the last years of, of Mobutu's era was to enter a world of cannibal capitalism. Despite being rich in diamonds and minerals, the Zarian economy contracted by more than 40% from 1988 to 1995, while gross domestic product per capita plummeted by 65% in the quarter century after 1958. Taken to their end point, these cannibal tendencies induce sustained social disintegration, whose inevitable result is social and ethnic fragmentation, political collapse at the national center, and a proclivity to civil war. Yet, local rulers and multinational corporations often continue to, pro to profit handsomely 
in these circumstances. While parasitism does not always reach this extreme, it inheres as a tendency embedded in the, tra the trajectories of many post-colonial states in sub-Saharan Africa. In the case of Nigeria, for instance, which has oscillated since independence between civilian and, mil and military rule, the siphoning of national wealth based on oil by ruling elites has produced a nation in which per capita income at 260 US dollars in 2003 is lower than it was at independence 40 years ago. Seven, struggle on the land enclosure, social inequality, and the crisis of kinship. One oft ignored aspect of neoliberalization is the escalation of conflicts over land. Yet, as most agrarian incomes contract at the same time as handsome prospects open up for a few, particularly where land can be used for ecotourism, safari hunting, timber, oil, or mineral extraction, much of rural Africa has been racked by rural displacement, private enclosure, disputes over ownership rights, including battles over squatting, and increased class differentiation in the countryside. Such trends have been well documented for a diverse range of countries and regions that includes Niger, the Ivory Coast, Botswana, Ghana, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Northern Nigeria, Mozambique, Northwest Cameroon, Southern Somalia, Northeast Tanzania, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Burkina Faso. At the poor fall, as the poor fall into debt and are forced to sell off and vacate their land, the better off can in turn buy up, consolidate, and enclose the soil. The resulting class differentiation is in turn sharply accelerated by the intensified market pressures of the neoliberal era, from reductions on subsidies for foodstuffs and fuel to newly restricted access to credit for the poor. With landlessness growing at one pole alongside concentrated ownership at another, older vi village structures and obligations are eroded by competitive market relations. The result, as one analyst notes, is not only intensifying competition over land, but deepening social differentiation, new social divisions that in some can be seen as class formation. With such social differentiation comes a transformation in sense of self and community, an enclosed self, a private accumulator and appropriator, one who increasingly treats economic resources as strictly private property and tends to withdraw from obligations to others. Consequently, responsibility for others declines and notions of community undergo a narrowing and the definition of belonging. Decreasing, decreasingly able to appeal to practices of reciprocity, the poor find their choices are migration to urban centers or theft and squatting. In response, the wealthy and government author authorities wage campaigns against squatters and prosecutions of the poor for taking formerly common goods, such as forest wood, in a context of intensifying conflicts over land and, de and demonization of one social group by another, witchcraft accusations flourish. 8. Squatter cities and the struggle for survival. As agriculture collapses and rural poverty mounts, a civil war and organized displacement sweep a number of countries. Africa's major cities are growing at a phenomenal rate. Notwithstanding efforts by colonialists to limit, to limit urbanization of Africans and keep them away from their administrative centers, African cities grew massively throughout the post-colonial period. Today, the continent has the highest rate of urbanization in the world. From the start, much African labor in these cities was concentrated in the informal sector. This awkward and somewhat misleading term describes a set of social economic practices outside of the standardized relations generally associated with large businesses or public service and their regularized hours, wages, and conditions of work. Street hawking, scavenging, petty production in the home, and the provision of services ranging from sex to transportation constitute the principal activities in this sector. 
And as manufacturing industries collapse and structural adjustment programs displace thousands of nurses, teachers, and civil service workers, as thousands pour into the cities from the countryside, and as unemployment mounts, this sector is growing exponentially, comprising the last hope for millions. Indeed, the United Nations estimates that fully 90% of Africa's new jobs of the early 21st century will be generated in the informal sphere. In important respects, urban evolution across Africa thus conforms to Mike Davis's incisive description of the emerging planet of, slum, planet of slums in which we now live, a world where the majority of humankind resides in cities, not on the land, huge numbers eking out a bare existence in the informal economy in the midst of squatter camps and sprawling ghettos awash with poverty. Rather than products of industrialization, as were many 19th century cities in Western Europe, observes Davis, third world cities frequently resemble 19th century Dublin, a city built largely on rural dislocation and poverty, not industrial growth. And while pulverized by the effects of global capitalism, falling commodity prices, rural depopulation, declining living standards and life expectancies, proliferation of urban slums, the majority so affected is not pulled into formalized wage labor. At the same time, and in opposition to unilinear tendencies in Davis's argument, these processes are inscribed within the making and remaking of African working classes complexly organized communities in which individuals and their kin combine wage labor, informal activities, and more in order to reproduce themselves. Unable to afford adequate housing, huge numbers of people across urban Africa crowd into substandard dwellings or squat on, on, on unoccupied land on the fringes or in the interstices of cities where they erect makeshift structures that offer minimal protection from the elements and that lack adequate sanitation or running water. There they combine with poor working class communities with distinct patterns of survival and resistance. The cumulative result of these movements in one part of the continent after another is momentous. Looking across Africa, Davis notes the emergence of a shantytown corridor of 70 million people that stretches from Abidjan to Ibadan, probably the biggest continuous footprint of urban poverty on earth. Nine, financialization, corruption, and magical capitalism. In the midst of appalling poverty, enormous fortunes continue to accumulate, particularly in the hands of new financial elites that have exploited the era of structural adjustment. We can trace some of the key processes involved by tracking financial liberalization in Nigeria. Beginning in the mid-1980s, Nigerian governments, newly committed to structural adjustment, eased access to the financial sector, making it much simpler to set up banks and lending, lending institutions while raising interest rates. The results were virtually instantaneous. The number of banks tripled between 1986 and 1992. 300 finance com companies emerged in 92 to 93 alone, while the number of mortgage firms increased more than tenfold from 23 in 1991 to 252 two years later. This untrammeled proliferation of financial institutions reflected the emergence of new accumulation strategies in the context of neoliberal restructuring. As one commentator notes, under structural adjustment, the financial circuit develops autonomously from the productive one, as new fields of valorization are opened up to finance new government debt, imports of luxuries as a result of trade liberalization, luxury housing as a result of increased income inequality and a multitude of speculative investments. But as in all contexts where speculation runs rampant, many investors cross the line into financial manipulation and fraud, especially as government retreated from regulating financial transactions. Military elites in Nigeria, long accustomed to breaking the rules and looting institutions, moved quickly into finance. 
bringing with them political connections and exceptional proficiency at fraud. By the early 1990s, pyramid schemes, check kiting, duplicate bookkeeping, bribery, and unbellished, unembellished swindles were endemic in the financial system. In some cases, the assets of banks were simply looted through fictitious transactions. Inevitably, financial institutions began to collapse. By 1995, Nigeria's financial sector was in the midst of a full-blown meltdown of the sort that creates opportunities for even more massive fraud. Not that Nigerian banks were unique in these respects. A 1993 U.S. Senate investigation revealed that the Western-based Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, which operated in many African countries, engaged in multiple forms of fraud and deception, among them arranging fabricated loans to the government of Cameroon, using state funds for illicit financial transactions, under and over invoicing imports and exports, depositing profits of fraud in overseas banks, laundering dirty money, and falsifying government accounts. BCCI was no isolated case. In 1994, American Express Bank was found guilty of deceiving the World Bank and the IMF by falsifying the accounts of the Kenyan government. And as we have learned throughout the global financial crisis that broke in 2008, Western banks and lending institutions, up to and including major investment banks like Lehman Brothers, were experts in dubious financial practices. But while exercises in swindling are by no means unique to Africa, they assume greater economic and cultural weight or productive methods of capital formation, investment in factories and equipment in particular, are few and far between. Financial transactions, intricate fraud, and speculation have been the principal means of constructing new fortunes in Africa during the era of structural adjustment. It thus comes as little surprise that throughout much of the continent, money is seen as something having a magical and mysterious quality which bears no relation to work and effort, as in short, an enchanted power.